record. And now I'll hand over to Anna. Thanks, Danny. Um, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our first Family Arts Lockdown webinar. Um, so my name is Anna Diva, and I'm the head of the Family Arts Campaign. Um, and it's so nice to see so many people joining us today. I think this is the biggest webinar that I've been on so far. Um, and it's great to see everyone, especially when it's nice and sunny outside. Um, and I hope you're all keeping well and keeping cool as well at home um, or in your office spaces today. Um, so we have a really interesting session planned this afternoon um, to explore how to create content for families that isn't only engaging, but it's also accessible. Um, and I think since lockdown was announced, obviously so much has changed um, with the arts and culture sector and the landscape for families. Um, and we've seen a real flurry of online activity become more widely available for families. Um, but I think it's also really important for us to consider how accessible that content is that we're creating, um, whether that's for an online activity or experience, um, for physical packs or resources we might be sending out to families, um, or preparing, as you know, many of us are now following yesterday's announcement for reopening um, a physical space and what that might look like in terms of access. Um, so I'm going to begin just by explaining a bit more about the session and how it's going to work today. And then I'm just going to explain a little bit more about the, the Family Arts Campaign. So today, um, we're delighted to be joined by three excellent speakers. Um, we're going to firstly hear from Julia Collar, who is uh, the founder and director of the inclusive sensory theatre company Collar and Cups. Um, shortly after that, we'll be hearing from Laura Golden, who is the co-founder of Handprint Theatre Company. And unfortunately, Charlotte Arrowsmith is unable to join us today and send her apologies. Um, but we're really delighted to be joined by Alex Novak, who is who'll be uh, supporting Laura in the, in the Q&A section of her talk. Um, and just to mention, as some of you might have noticed, in this webinar, we we're also supported by Becky Barry, who is providing BSL for this event. Um, and just a few things to note, really, on that, that this interpretation um, means that we might have a slight time lag, at, you know, at various times throughout the webinar. But please don't let this, um, you know, change how you speak or ask questions or change your usual uh, pace or tone, um, and Becky and Alex have, have told told us that she'll let us know. They'll let us know as, as soon as you know if, if anything needs repeating or an unpacking um, or rephrasing. Um, and I, I suppose just to mention as well that we're, we're also aware that access is a, a huge topic, um, and we won't have time in this session um, to focus on every element that goes into creating um, an inclusive environment for families. But we have reserved sort of pockets of time after each presentation and also at the end for um, questions from delegates, but also time to, to hear from you really and your experiences and things you'd like to raise that might we might not have picked up on already. Um, and also following this webinar, we'll be running a series of, of events in future. So the, if, if there is something, you know, that hasn't been raised in this, I'm sure we can look at it in, a, in another session. Um, so yes, so please, I know it can be slightly unnerving to turn your video off and um, pose a question, but we really want this session to be interactive and we want to hear from everybody um, who's, who's attending today. So please do sh you know, share your experience. Um, you can also do so on um, social media as well. So you can follow us um, using at Family Arts One and the hashtag Family Arts um, to ask questions or join in the discussion and also share you know things that you you found as well on this topic um so before before i hand over to julia i just wanted to talk a little bit more about the the family arts campaign which some of you might already know and um, quite a lot about but um just to sort of put it um put it in a nutshell really that we are a, a national cross-sector initiative to increase engagement in arts culture and creativity for families. Um, we are one of Arts Council England sector support organisations, so we work across the sector, including museums and libraries, to, to essentially do three things. Um, we want to increase 
the amount and the range of family activities and events and experiences. Um, but also we want to focus on improving that quality of experience for a range of people that, that we consider make, that make up that family unit, um, which we definitely don't see as a 2.4 parent-child model. We know it's a very diverse group. Um, and lastly, we want to help the, the cultural sector reach more families through marketing um, and PR support. Um, and we're actually quite a small team, um, for those of you who know us, but we're actually only three members of staff that run the campaign. But we have the support of a, a wider consortium who help us to um, frame what we do to make sure it's relevant across different, different sectors and art forms. So we work with UK Theatre and the Association of British Orchestras, um, Kids in Museums, Libraries Connected, and, and, and the AMA, who are helping us run this webinar, amongst others. Um, and I suppose what we want to do as, as a campaign, really, is to create an active and involved network of followers um, who can really work with us to really champion why being family friendly and why being inclusive and accessible is, is so important, particularly now um, when the cultural sector is, is facing particular difficulties. Um, so a few things to mention on that. We, we run the, the family arts and the age friendly standards where we really ask um, senior leaders in organisations to to sign up to those standards and champion their organization as being family friendly and and age friendly um, and that can range from looking at programming pricing and um, physical access and um, content relationship building with the community and um, all the things that go into what makes you being a family friendly venue or a, a company or artist um, we also want to support cultural organisations to reach more families. So we have our public listing site, which is called Fantastic for Families, and we'll send some more information about this after the webinar. Um, but this offers completely free marketing support um, to list any events, but also, especially now with, with everything that's going on with COVID, um, pre-recorded materials, um, at downloadable resources, activities, um, links to physical packs that are going to be sent out. And we work with partners like NetMums and The List um, to help those activities go much further to a potential 9 million families. So it's absolutely worth checking out Fantastic for Families if you haven't done it already, because it's completely free and we're actively working on it to get your content out to more families. Um, and I suppose as well to mention that we were so aware that we're working in an incredibly difficult and changing environment at the moment where things are just massively different for difficult and different for families. Um, so we're building on some insights, gaining insights from families and working with researchers to, to look at how changes across the sector are going to affect attitudes and behaviours to arts engagement. But I suppose this is a bit of a call out to everyone who's attending today. If you do have any research that you're working on in your local community or with your um, local organisations, please do share that with us because we're, we're very much looking to, to gather as much information we can um, from different people. Um, and we'll be, as Danny said, we'll be sending around a recording of the webinar, but we'll also be sending some more information and let you know how to get in touch with us. Um, but please do, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so that is, I think, everything for now from me and the, the Family Arts Campaign. So, um, so yeah, I'll hand over to Julia to, to start her presentation. Julia, I think you're muted. Oh, there you go, hello. Can everyone hear me now? Brilliant. Okay, so hi, I'm Julia and I'm from Collar and Cuffs Co. I'm a sole trader theatre company and I work with freelance artists. I mostly create work for 0 to 7 for children in the early years and people with complex needs. You can be of any age, and mainly people with severe learning disabilities, profound and multiple learning disabilities. I also create sensory tours for cultural venues, museums, gardens, 
um, you name it, anywhere that might want some kind of sensory engagement. And I provide consultancy to other uh, companies and to schools around developing their sensory approaches. So here's a little, little sample of my work. Now, I came into sensory work in theatres through a slightly different angle. There are a number of sensory theatre companies around the UK, and I would say that I'm probably a niche within a niche in that many of the companies come at it from an angle which is around uh, catering specifically for special educational needs, creating art because art is something that should be engaging and inclusive for everyone. I came into it from an angle to do with mental health because my background is in specialist mental health youth work and particularly looking at the impact of emotional and developmental trauma on children and young people. And I'm going to explain a little bit about that because I think it's a really, really healthy and helpful thing to do at this point in time as artists and people who work in the creative sector, people who are within families, people within networks and communities who are having some really difficult times. So, oh, going the wrong way in my presentation. Here we go. So, what is trauma? So, just to understand what it is. So, it's, it's an overwhelming response to stressful events or circumstances. And there's what I call big T trauma. So, big T trauma are um, sort of big events that happen to you that cause a traumatic reaction. It could be a car crash. It could be um, a physical assault of some kind. And then there are the little T traumas, which are things which um, are part of your environment and are things that are hard to escape. So for children, for example, it could be living around domestic abuse, it could be living with bullying, it's events which are serial, all on a small level, but the cumulative effects of them can have a really significant impact on mental health and well-being. And then you've got the complex form, which is kind of a combination of the two. And trauma is really important to understand, particularly when we're working with early years, because it can happen to children even in utero, even if they're developing inside their mum's tummy, they could be starting to accrue a history of trauma. And it makes us more prone to living in our reptile brain, I'll come to that in a minute, and it can make us more reactive to situations of stress around us. And I wanted to develop theatre work that would really help early years children and their parents and carers and people with complex needs have a better understanding of what their brain and bodies are doing when they're faced with really big feelings or really challenging circumstances. So I come at it from that place of neuroscience and mental health. So all of my work is around emotional development, mental health, um, well-being, and how to support parent carer attachment. So the good sensory news about this, and the reason why I have a sensory methodology is that Sensory information is one of the first systems that develops in your brain. So I'd like you to take a moment to have a little feel of your head. We're used to touching our hair when we're doing our makeup or whatever. Give it a good old shuffle around. But it's actually really good to touch your head. It's a nice, comforting thing to do. So the base of your head, right at the back, have a little feel there. That's your brain stem, your survival mechanism, and that's where most of your sensory systems are located. It's the first part of your brain to develop, and it's the one that lizards and things have dinosaur brains. That's sometimes we call it the reptile brain. Then in this lovely middle section where you might wear your sunglasses, you've got your emotional brain, and then build on top of it at the front, give your brain a hug, or put your hands on your forehead, the lovely thing to do, um, is your um, cognitive ability, your ability to reason and manage impulse and control. And with children from their very early years and with people with complex needs, we're building brains from the bottom up. And we use sensory approaches in our work to help understand our emotions, to help regulate. And for me as well with our work, it's also about building some early theatre literacy skills about how can you cope in a highly participative, very sensory, overwhelming experience of theatre and be able to attend to it, to concentrate and to regulate your body to be able to, to participate. It's a skill we have to teach children, they can't just do it. Sensory approaches are also massively inclusive and accessible for everyone, they are timeless. And um, there is no one who doesn't have a moment of delight if you go to them and sprinkle a load of confetti upon them. It is a glorious and wonderful thing, whatever age you are. And particularly for the children and young people I work with who have complex needs, they can struggle sometimes with understanding what's pretend and staying with stories. If you give them the real stuff from a story, so if you're telling them the nativity story, 
frankincense is an abstract concept. You might have never come across it in your social and life experience, but give them actual frankincense to smell and to feel. You can stay with the story a little bit better. And then I use my work to teach adults and children alike how they can use those sensory resources to help manage those big feelings and enjoy improved well-being and mental health. So with that, so looking at the little t trauma, I would say that probably everyone here in this session today has experienced over the last few months little t trauma. We've experienced relentless waves of anxiety and information that's escaping us and uh, loss of work, loss of jobs, loss of social connections. We're dealing with a traumatised group of people and people who are in trauma experience life in a very different way. So when I was creating um, my work during lockdown, um, I was thinking about my audience and my audience have fragile brains anyway because they're at early stages of, of development and they are easily dysregulated sometimes because of the special educational needs. But more generally, I'm dealing with um, parents who are supporting children who are also in that state of trauma themselves. And when they're in that state, they can be much more easily overwhelmed by sensory information. Screen time has a different meaning um, and it may be a toss with sort of family conventions and culture around using screen. And it can be difficult to get people to engage and participate and lead experiences for themselves at home. That might feel like too much because maybe they've got work to do, maybe there's a household, maybe they're experiencing stress with illness or family isolation and difficulties recalling things as well. So very simple things that we have in children's theatre where there's lots of repeated elements of storytelling, even those can be really hard for some people to hang on to and stay with. And what's also important to remember is when we are in phases of trauma, very often our brain age regresses and we need to go back and re-enjoy those experiences we had when we were much littler, when things were much less demanding, when things were a lot simpler. So I've seen quite a lot of much older children, my 9, 10, 11 year olds, who are now wanting to access the BB's level content because it's what their brains can best cope with at the moment. And it's about how do we help people feel comfortable with that uh, because they're making mentally healthy choices. It's not, it's not age inappropriate. So in my work, I work with nine sensory systems. You're probably familiar with the first five. But I also work with your vestibular system, your proprioceptive, your interoceptive, and your numinous. So those are all good words that you can, can look up and learn about. And so what was my response to um, COVID-19 and lockdown? Well, first of all, I'm a parent. I have seven-year-old twins, both of whom are neurodivergent. And so the experience then of loss of routine, loss of being at school, being at home, homeschooling, and I'm an experienced practitioner, but teaching my children, even with my greatest ambitions in mind of this fantastic education experience we're going to have, it's been really relentlessly hard work. And it's because we're all in that state of trauma. And I was very aware within the first couple of days of school finishing um, that there was a deluge of online content appearing from creatives, from theatre companies, from art galleries. It was an absolutely massive response. And I was really quite overwhelmed because where do you start with all of this magnificent stuff coming at you? And so much of it was free. And I think that's really amazing too. So I took a couple of days just to reel from it. And I tried a bit of Joe Wicks and bailed out. It's really not for me. And um, then I thought about, well, what do I want to do? Because there's this real um, sense of obligation, that sense of wanting to do something creative because you're a creative person. And because my work is about mental health and well-being, I felt I really ought to contribute something to continue supporting my audiences, and particularly those audiences who are often overlooked. So my FLD and PMLD audiences, and my children who have high functioning forms of autism and or mental health difficulties. So I took a couple of days to think about where did I see myself in this? And as a parent, as well as a creative, I knew that I couldn't come up with a vast amount of content on an everyday basis. And I've been so impressed by theatre companies that are still putting out live, fresh content every single day. I think that's remarkable, but for me, not sustainable. So I have a little taster of this because just before lockdown hit, I was up in Stratford-on-Avon installing sensory tours into the garden of Shakespeare's house. And it was one of the most brilliant pieces of work I ever had 
but it's never going to happen. And one of the conversations we had as lockdown started to loom was, what do we do with our sensory work? And we had a discussion about, well, where's the level of comfort and safety? We can take out anything to do with touch. We can take out things to do with smell and taste, which are your big risks for infection. But then that just leaves us with our visual and auditory. But there are issues with that. We can't do live singing. Um, I can't stand at a distance and belt across a garden. That's not a great experience for anyone. We have some other activities we can do, but they're hard to translate. And really, we reach the point where there's nothing that we can do and the activity has to stop. And I was really mindful of that when I was planning my own approaches as to what, what is safe to do and to invite people to participate in, bearing in mind some of my audiences are medically vulnerable as well. So the first thing to, to have in mind is that any digital response is a sensory response. It's a passive sensory experience. You're dealing with visual and auditory information. And any of those other senses we want to bring into play are about how people then are invited to get engaged. And you also need your audience to prepare for them. You can't suddenly say to them, you need a smell of rosemary. Well, you have to go and get the rosemary and be ready to introduce it. And it's a continual issue with and why sensory work hasn't worked particularly well online up till now is how do we get people to go from passive consumers of visual and auditory material, sensory material, into being active and interactive within it. And we've also got to appreciate how people were using digital content before the lockdown and why they're using it now. And there is an appreciable difference. Even with things like, and there's no value judgment here because I do it too, about digital babysitting. So very often before lockdown, digital content is given to early years children and people with complex needs to occupy them while parents do other things. It could be housework. Um, for a number of the families that I work with in more um, reprise communities where adults have experienced high levels of trauma, they use it to buy themselves time to regulate their own systems. It, to, to sort of step aside from parenting for a little while to get themselves back online. And it has been sort of the same within lockdown, but probably to a more amplified degree. And we have to be aware of that because there are risks that go with it, particularly by young people around addictive behaviour and around rationing screen time and using the behaviour modification. So I came up with three projects that I thought I wanted to seek funding for. Because at the same time, there was this deluge of work just coming out of nowhere, there are also funders saying, we've got funding here, or what are you going to do with it? How do we respond? And I had three that I wanted to do. One was some sensory trails, because you do what you know, and I'm good at developing sensory trails. And it was something that I could gift to my village and also to my family. My neurodivergent kids need a lot of movement, and getting them involved in that piece of work, taking them out and going for walks would be really helpful for them, and I know for other neurodivergent children in the village. I wanted to put some of our existing productions into story videos and discovery packs. It's been an ambition for a very long time, and this seems like the perfect thing to do. So content that my audience is needed right now to occupy and engage and to educate. And then I was thinking about, well, what do I want to give my audiences further down the line? And because I'm a trauma-informed practitioner, I could see we're going to end up with a lot of children with high levels of separation anxiety, um, difficulties reconnecting socially, and with that real sense of trauma that they can't process comfortably. And so I had these, these three little projects. And I was incredibly lucky in that while I lost all of my touring work for the rest of this year, I've been able to replace it with funding. And within a week, I had all three of them funded. And you can go and have a look at what those projects um, oh, and um, tell me what you think of them. That'd be great. So it's important to recognise that I did three different things here. One is the village trails were offline. They were physical trails within social distancing regulations at their very, very, very strictest and are still in operation now. Things have started to relax a little bit. They were um, supported by a Facebook page to sort of galvanise and gain interest and to give progress reports and to respond to questions. And there was a single digital resource that went with that that people could stream through YouTube or on the Facebook page um, to accompany one of the trails. There were three different trails, an early years one, a Pokemon trail and a history and mystery one for older children and adults. Then my uh, story videos and discovery packs were entirely digital content but they were printable and beautifully some special schools 
um, contacted me and said, can we print these off in um, lower, lower res versions without all the images to physically give to people? And can we download the video and burn it to a DVD? So there were some, some offline stuff. And the packs that go with those videos are about delivering those stories offline as well, recreating a little performance at home using sensory stuff. So it is both engaging with the digital, but also offline. And then lastly is the Sensory Story Suite, which is specifically about processing the emotional experience of living through lockdown for early years of people with complex needs, all entirely hosted online and specifically designed to be used offline, but it has um, integration with videos on YouTube and also soundtrack on SoundCloud. So for me, when I create um, my work, I was thinking about with audio and visual work, there is a significant proportion of people within our special needs audience who don't find audio visual content meaningful and they prefer other forms of sensory interaction and communication. Digital is one dimension, it's how we then back it up with other things. And that's not necessarily because those people have got a specific sensory impairment they can't see or they can't hear. It's about how their brain processes information and makes sense of things. So we have to be really careful. We might make a piece of work that's as inclusive as possible, as sensory as possible, but there are still going to be a lot of people who can't access it. And we have to feel in some ways okay with that or work out some really clever ways of, of circumnavigating it. And I'm not sure what those answers are. And then for um, the early years audience and also for our SEN audience, the primary user isn't actually the child. The primary user is the adult because we need them to facilitate the experience for their child and to be alongside them to gather resources together and to interact with them. The secondary user are, are the, the children and it's working out well how do we balance that? How do we make sure we're still creating artistic content that's high quality and engaging for children while at the same time encouraging and supporting our adults. Bearing in mind a number of them are living in trauma responses and have got low levels of motivation, high levels of stress, and are perhaps not in the best position to be able to give their child that, that time and that input. So here are some things that I came up with about making my work more accessible, and they may be relevant to you as well. And I think there's sort of key things around what do we do with, um, with our SEN audience? We have families who are quite experienced in picking up online resources, particularly in the sensory field, and using them. They have a good level of literacy around doing that. Their children are exposed to it at school, and often there is an intersection between what happens at school and what happens at home. They can pick up resources and run with them. They know what to do. But how do we educate other audiences that don't have that level of experience and get them on board with doing some sensory interactive stuff? It's really important that when you're asking people to collate sensory resources to integrate into a theatre experience online, you're making those resources really affordable and easy to get hold of. At the height of lockdown, when no one could go anywhere and everyone's struggling financially, I was thinking about well, what we've got in the cupboard that we could just whip out. And for me, that sits really comfortably with my methodology because I'm all about using low cost, no cost resources to create significant impact. And there's some other bits and pieces there that you might want to consider uh, later on. I'm not going to go into all of them because I'm aware that my time is ticking down. And to sort of consider as well, what is the gap between what grown ups want their children to be doing online and what children themselves want to do? I think that's a really key one to be um, aware of. There's a lot of trends around sensory experiences. There's lots of baby sensory classes. It's seen as quite a sort of trendy thing to do. But does that translate for children? Is that what children want to be doing now? How can we find activities that meet children's emotional needs as well as creative needs? And then finally, these are sort of my, my little guidelines around it. It's, if you're doing sensory work and carrying on sensory work moving forward, it's how do we make that um, safe and how do we continue to make it meaningful and for me now looking at how I can get my work back up and out into the world I'm really not sure what the future holds in terms of delivering sensory work and I know it's something a lot of other sensory companies are struggling with as well things are going to be problematic for us for a very long time and sensory work is strongest when we have that magical close interaction with someone and can share a resource but we're really limited. We can't share resources that involve singing, we can't involve touch, we can't do taste and smell. So maybe we need to create productions which are all about those other senses, so the vestibular, the proprioceptive. But are those going to be the right experiences to be able to deliver 
the mental health messages that are really important that come from our audiences. Um, we can consider delivering more work outdoors. We do quite a lot of that anyway, but doing more of that and doing micro performances one on one rather than wider open ones. Uh, unlike many other essential theatre companies, we tend to work with audiences around 50 to 60 at a time rather than sort of six to 10 people. Um, so we have quite large audiences, but maybe bringing that down and doing one to one. Um, I'm not sure what the answers are, and I know another, um, uh, a lot of companies are looking at technological solutions and doing more about um, audio-visual stuff and taking that out to be with audiences. But for me, that still fails to reach a significant number of people. The senses are so rich and we need to engage all of them as much as possible um, in order to regulate, to communicate and connect and to convey messages and to be together in theatre. Um, so this is kind of where I'm, I'm at at the moment and what I'm, I'm thinking about. And I think they're going to be kind of things that resonate for you, whether you work in museums, whether you work in libraries, it's, it's when we no longer have the ability to touch and we can't smell and we can't be with each other in close proximity and we can't sing in our rhyme time. What takes that space and what continues to, to, to deliver on all of those things that children really need from us and our prosody and attachment to it and so on? So I'll conclude my little presentation there. I skipped over lots of things, but you can probably go back through my slides and have a little read. And do feel free to drop me an email if you want to sort of bash around some ideas. I'm always open to uh, being challenged and uh, just sort of kicking ideas and concepts around. Great. Thank you very much, Julia. That was a great presentation. Um, we now have about 10 minutes for questions. For Julia. So if anyone has anything that they'd like to ask, they feel free to turn your microphone or your video on and ask us in person, um, or you can pop your question in the chat. So we'll just give you a moment or two to think that through if you've got a question. Something I might pick up on. Um, I make work just down the road from Luton, and Luton is an incredibly deprived community. And understanding digital poverty and the realities of that is really important. We cannot make accessible digital experiences if large numbers of our audiences that need our work do not have digital access. And it's how we, we work around that. In Luton at the moment, around 20% of families do not have any access to any internet. And given how difficult it's been to get education to those families when all of it's been delivered online, uh, we really do need to be concerned about that and about whether things can be online and offline and equal experiences. I think that's, that's really important. Um, if I'm able to ask a question, is that okay? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, oh, absolutely, Ruth. Um, I've not turned my camera on. I can't quite work out how to do it. This is the first time <laughs> using um, WebEx. Um, I just had a conversation just to pick up on what you were saying around um, digital poverty and kind of the, you know, the digital divide that's being created by a lot of charities obviously embracing um, the kind of digital sort of revolution as it were and the fact that this is a, a great way to share resources particularly with uh, with families. Um, one of the things that we have done um, before lockdown when we launched our app was to make sure that um, content can be downloaded to be sort of viewed and listened to offline but um, I think kind of my concern around that is that um, when we developed um, the app, um, it was being introduced at the end of, um, I, I work for Scottish Book Trust, sorry, I should have introduced myself on the BookBug program, which is similar to BookStart um, in England. And we've just recently launched a new, a new app with songs and rhymes and stories, et cetera, on it that's available for free. Um, so our intention was that families would be able to download these pieces of content um, on public Wi-Fi, say after a book bug session, or you know when they're at a health visitor appointment, etc. Um, but my concern at the moment is within lockdown that they're not getting any internet access at all. And I was just wondering about any um, ways that we could recommend that families 
work around that. I have sort of seen personally going past some people sitting outside libraries still using their free Wi-Fi, but are there any other options that might be available to them that you might be able to recommend? I think um, I think that's really, really important. Um, the, the best examples that I have had a personal experience of during this phase of creativity has been the direct work with schools where you are either placing resources directly to schools or else there's loads and loads of practitioner forums and groups on Facebook where people are sharing resources and people then approach you and say, can we do this with it? And it's to be, to be as open as possible and saying yes and sharing original source files or making DVDs available. And schools have been absolutely fantastic in saying, particularly with some of my strings and things, stuff which is about um, the emotional impact of lockdown saying so there is a family that needs this now I'm going to print it and I'm going to physically put it through their door and I will put some other bits and pieces in it and it's, it's getting I think people particularly in positions of education who really know their children to have that ability to, to be the conduit the go-between between between the digital and the offline for that family and harnessing those relationships that's really helpful, thank you. Christine, did you have a question? I think Christine's muted. There we go. Hi. That's better. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Hello. Hi. Hi. So I work for a small local authority museum in Rotherham, and I um, lead on engagement in a lot of areas, including early years. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the challenges we've got, so this relates to COVID, is that because of what's happened, we can't. We um, a lot of the stuff we're going to have to take out for the interaction relates specifically to early years. So when they revisit the museum socially distance, um, there's not all the interaction that they've previously had. And I was interested in you were talking about your sensory story trails. Could you tell us a little bit more about them? Because I'm just thinking of different ways we could engage we also the museum's also in a park so i'm thinking that might kind of work oh, that's ideal. that yeah. is absolutely ideal so my sensory story trails um they were created at the height of lockdown so they couldn't involve anything that involved um touching objects um you could obviously touch members of your own household um they couldn't involve anything that involved smelling um there were lots and lots of bits that i would normally put into a trail like my trail for shakespeare's garden all about you know, feeling rosemary and drawing on surfaces and all of that kind of stuff can't do any of that so it was a real challenge to practice to think about what you could do so my my sensory trail was around my village and took in features of, of the local village for example um, we have one of the old-fashioned victorian pumps on the village green and so there's a storyboard there a correct storyboard so it's weather resistant and it's white proof and i go around twice a week and wipe it down with anti-vac also because dogs pee up it as well and <laughs> on it it has um what's the story and then talks about the pump and then it has some suggestions for activities that adults can do with their child to play with the pump so the adult becomes the pump and we pump their arms up and down and we do some early maths activities. Can we pump to 10? Can we pump to 20? And if you have buckets in your arms, can you carry them? How long can you hold your arms up for? And we might sing some songs. And at each one of those prompts, there would be something like that where people can interact with each other. So there's another bit, which is a run of paving stones. And I use the Christopher Robbins. Um, poem about not stepping on the cracks in the pavement in case the bears get you so the children jump in and out of the paving stones and the adult becomes the bear and if they step on a crack you have to sweep them up and give them a big hug and a cuddle um, things like at the village ponds we have beautiful willow trees so I made that 
my ship sailed from China, and I hung loads of stuff very high up in the tree that children could find to see what the boat brought from China. And you sing the song, and you work out what kind of activity you might want to do. And in the community garden, I did a version of the hungry caterpillar, but physically put it around the garden and attached it to the fruit and vegetables that were growing there, so children can have a look at those. And also, to, I put a little message in there about um, for, for our fussy eaters, and it's about the caterpillar says, if I don't try it, how will I know if I don't like it? And then later, when lockdown um, is going to ease, it will be safer to take fruits and vegetables from the garden home with you because you can pick what you like from the community garden and you can actually taste it and manage that at home by washing your food. Um, the local baker put up some boards in their window and some salt dough, currant buns, and people stand outside and sing five currant buns in the baker's shop and uh, jump up and down and wave at them and the bakers absolutely love it it's sort of things like that what what features do we have in that environment how can we link them to songs and stories that are really familiar for people so there's that kind of this doesn't feel too much this doesn't feel too scary and it's sensory and regulating and movement and connection and bonding but without being high risk for infection so that's um, amazing. thank you that's really amazing I think I need to get some money. I need you. <laughs> oh, bless you. I'm very, very happy to send you my boards and you can see what you can, can mirror oh, and translate into many different lovely. environments. Yeah, yeah, that would be absolutely lovely. I think they're, they're really nice things. And actually, I think they could work across lots of age groups, not just early years, but that's fabulous. Thank you very much. Really, really nice and inclusive and can get every generation involved. What I did do with that is that was my digital resource that went with that trail. I had a YouTube video where I sang all the songs. So if somebody wasn't feeling very comfortable with singing or didn't know a song, they could play the video on their smartphone as they went round and they would hear me singing, whatever it might be. Oh, so that's a good idea. Yeah, with, with that, and it's just whether you've got a smartphone or not. Yeah, I just put in the um the comments and it's from Adele about how you assess children's emotional activity needs. Um, there are lots and lots of different ways of doing that, um, which are in line with sort of early years and um, different kinds of structures you might have in special education. What I would say at the moment is assume that every child is struggling, and it's about creating feelings of security, safety connection, familiarity and routine. So if you know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs with the, with the triangle, right at the bottom are our needs for security and that's where we need to focus. So it's looking at sort of all of those early years stuff that we do, about lots of activities that involve kind of rocking. You would rock a baby if it was distressed, but there's loads of physical activities you could do with rocking, like rowing the boat, um, lots of hugs and cuddles, lots of songs that are really familiar and regulating. Rhythm is amazing. There's lots and lots of um, different bits and pieces you can use. Chris, it's talk about online when you're not in contact with the audience. Um, again, I would make I would make some generalisations there from looking at my own children, um, from looking at um, the children I see in my local community who are engaging in my you know, sensory trails, that's kind of my barometer of, of what might be needed. And there are core things that, that every everybody and everybody's brain needs in order to thrive, and it's making sure we build in as much of those as possible. And while we are not able always to do the sensory activities that are your smell, your taste and your touch, actually the sort of the proprioceptive and the vestibular ones can be really, really helpful at the moment and it's including enough of of those i think great thank you very much julia um i think that has addressed all the questions that we've had but if anyone has any questions that they didn't have the opportunity to ask we will have a good amount of time at the end of the session for you to revisit that um, so thank you very much julia and for all the questions we're going to go into a five minute comfort break now um, so feel free to get up, get some time away from your screen and grab a drink. Um, my clock says that it's 3.20, so we'll be coming back at 3.25 to start with the next presentation. Thank you.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, I'm just going to double check that we've got all of our trainers in place. Um, so lovely, I can see Laura, great, I can see Becky and I can see Alex, fabulous. Um, so I think we're all ready to start the next session. Um, Anna, did you want to say anything or shall I hand straight over to Laura? And um, no, just to say a huge thank you to, to Julia. Um, such a fascinating presentation. Um, and yeah, we'll have more, more time, as, as Danny said at the end, to discuss. Um, just, just to remind everyone, if, if anyone wants to comment on social media, it's that the, um, use the hashtag family arts to, to sort of if you want to tag anything or, or ask any further questions after the webinar. And um, obviously we've got the chat function for now. Um, but yeah, no, very happy to just hand over to, to Laura and Alex for, for their section. Hi, okay. I Hopefully everyone can, I'm, yeah, perfect. <laughs> On to WebEx, eh? New technological platforms that we are all enjoying every day. <laughs> Um, so I'm Laura and I'm one of the co-founders of Hamperin and we have a whole team of different creatives. So although Charlotte couldn't be here today, Alex is also another very valuable member of the team. And so although he hasn't um, been involved in the prep of the presentation, I'm sure he's going to have lots of wise ideas to share with us at the end. So we are Hamperin Theatre and our, our kind of journey as a theatre company has changed. Um, we began very much talking about the fact that we were deaf and hearing creatives working together for deaf and hearing families. And although that mission hasn't changed, um, we felt that we, that's not the only thing about us. And for us, that was very much, of course, that's who, of course, we would be deaf and hearing people. Why, why would any theatre company not be deaf and hearing people working together? And so we really wanted to, to focus on what our work was. So our work is very much theatre for and with young people. And again, that's for deaf people, for hearing people, for both. So you can imagine we use many, many word counts saying deaf and hearing, deaf and hearing, whereas we kind of expect that should be expected with all work. Um, so yeah, so that's what we create and what we have created pre-COVID. As you can see from all of our pictures, we're surrounded by people by similar to Julia, that idea of coming together, of communicating and with sign language and deaf people and deaf culture, we're all very kind of hands on when we're doing a workshop. It's, it's very unusual that you won't be kind of got attention from someone grabbing your arm or what have you. That, that is the community that we live in and the culture that we, we love and we, we value in all of our work. So whether that's creating projects, participation projects, all creating shows, all of it is based on this kind of idea of us all coming together, <laughs> which obviously lockdown is not a fan of. <laughs> and so we did uh, similarly have this moment of reflection and what can we do and feeling that the, the pressure to do something as well, like the feeling that not just for us as creatives, but also for our young people that we're used to working with. So we put our heads together to try and work out how we could shift what we do already and keep our values, but creating new content. Um, and obviously accessibility was, was through all of this. We, we are not particularly techie people, and um, I'll go into that in a minute, but trying to use technology to create the same sense of community and communication just feels like a whole different mountain. But we have, we have persevered and we've been working on projects using YouTube Live, which um, to try and create that sense of interaction and so that young people really do feel that we can connect even if they're in their home. Uh, we created a friendly, fra uh, friendly Faces series of videos where we asked each of our creatives to create a video based on something that inspires them. So it could have been a film or a book or a character, something that made them feel really creative. And so each each creative made that video in their own way. And then we've been posting those sporadically. Um, and we're currently halfway through that process of videos. 
and and part of that was to to try and inspire young people to not just think about the fact that we are locked down it was more about opening our our mindset to think about actually what can make me feel creative again even if i am at home i can still feel creative because i've got this book or whatever i'm imagining in terms of creating my own story and then also we similarly went through that that stage at the beginning where everyone was putting out all these filmed version of their shows and we were thinking well we have got some but we don't feel they're good enough quality to really reflect the show and also the show is so based on responding to to who's there in the room so actually watching a video of somebody else being there is that that's not what our work's about and it didn't feel right to put online something that doesn't reflect our values and what we are and so we decided to we we again but we do not have the capacity to be putting out content every single day but we do want to support our family and especially families who may not be used to having to create activities every day or also families who a lot of hear, uh, deaf children have hearing parents so they might not be able to communicate as fluently as they can to their deaf peers at school or their deaf teachers so again, there's a communication barrier even at home. And so by creating, um, we've been doing three, two or three activities a week, which are all just kind of activities that as practitioners, we probably think are quite simple and our kind of usual toolbox. But just to remind parents that you can play grandma's footsteps without having to speak loads or sign loads. You can just be present with each other. And so we've been doing that. So we did three a week and then now we've got our videos going out as well. So it's gone down to two. But I completely agree with Julia. It is so hard to think now we are so far in and we're still trying to maintain that relationship to families. And when do we say, actually, this is too much for us to keep creating? So it's, it's, it's been working well with our, our kind of three different activities and the videos. But again, at some point, we have to make a decision when do we stop <laughs> um which will be a whole new thing uh, as we go forward so as a as a whole industry post uh corona and post looking at the wider field after what we've been creating again those organizations that rush of online material that importance of feeling we need to do something online otherwise everyone's going to forget about our work um, and digital platforms just becoming so overwhelmed with constant, there's a show here, there's a show here, and you almost don't want to miss all these shows. But then when we actually looked at them, very, very few were actually providing access. And in this rush of getting activity out there, there weren't captions to shows, or if there were, they were auto captioned. So a lot of them weren't right. So we felt that we couldn't share them on our social media to our families because they weren't accessible. Um, and so we started working, well, we contacted the Family Arts Campaign and we kind of explained our predicament and said, look, we're trying to support other families and we can't create content every single day, but we're trying to share other accessible shows. And um, can we write something to you, an article for you to just explain the importance of this and that this shouldn't be a second a second thought and they were really kind and said yep yeah, go ahead so it was a really nice chance for us to to feel like we were kind of explaining to organizations because we don't want to say you should be you know we don't want to we know everyone's under a lot of pressure but at the same time for young deaf people and for families having that kind of overwhelm seeing with all this content online but not being able to access any of it i mean that's like a double barrier isn't it i i, I that's a build up and not supporting anyone and especially also if there's deaf families like deaf parents with hearing children again if they can't watch something together that's like a massive part of what we do as theater like family theater makers so then i think it's really important as as an industry, we don't just think about us as organizations, but we think about the families and the families that we spend so much time and energy <laughs> creating work for and thinking about that, that change of routine and how that is gonna change their mental health, but also their relationships if they're not used to seeing 
people 24 hours a day. I mean, it's testing for adults, but for young people as well, that's really tough. And also in terms of schools closing, for our, some of our deaf young people who go to a boarding school, uh, which closes down, they go back to their hearing families. Maybe they have a relationship with their parents, but all of their deaf peers and deaf support network as being a young deaf person growing up has been separated, is in a completely different place. So it felt even more important and more um, vital that we worked out a way to make our work accessible, to try and build those connections, allow young deaf people to see deaf role models and to see deaf and hearing people working together as well. And again, that loss of independence. I think all all young people, the moment they've been told they're just they're just at home with their parents, suddenly feel that trapped. And so that's a massive thing as a young deaf person who's used to connecting with their friends. Again, that's that's a massive impact. And for us, and I think for everybody, access stays just as important throughout. Like it doesn't matter if it's a lockdown, it doesn't matter if it's pantosis, whatever whatever we're creating access should stay as part of that um, important message and I think most people that are here will probably agree <laughs> um, I don't think anyone says I don't want to provide access but it's the how to do it and I understand that that is tricky. <laughs> the technology <laughs> as a company who are very hands-on we do a lot of arts and crafts we are not big fans of relying on a lot of equipment because things happen and <laughs> um, and we've definitely found ourselves through this lockdown period which as we've said is great if people have the technology at all um, again a lot of our families don't have that <laughs> so that's that's another conversation but in terms of those that do the quality of the technology like wi-fi we've had within our own team like today like so many problems with wi-fi and adding that frustration and lack of control if a young person has put a show in front of them and they can access, access it but their wi-fi breaks it adds to that level of frustration also jargon us as theater makers we do not <laughs> understand all this technical jargon and even with um our technical team they don't necessarily know all of the bits and pieces so it's been quite a challenge in terms of all of those bits and pieces and so for us when we've created work online uh, it's been very much about thinking about practicing it a million times and trying to play with your equipment. Having any anybody with rem a tiny bit of information to help is really good, as well as rehearsing and playing with that equipment, um, which I'm sure everyone has been finding as they've been developing their new <laughs> techno digital work practice, I guess. Uh, linking a little bit to the article that we wrote, um, which was about ways you can make your work accessible. Obviously captions, but do be careful of auto captions because obviously this on the beautiful BBC News is not necessarily accurate. And, and again, if we're creating family work, we don't know what that auto caption mistake is gonna be. That word might not be appropriate for our family audiences. So I think us as family theatre makers, we need to really prioritize that we put in the captions ourselves and we know what language we're using. Again, um, Stage Tech have got some really good resources about captions, and there are a lot of blogs online about adding captions. So there are resources there, it just takes a bit of time to find them. Um, using BSL is fab, because some people, English is not their first language, they are BSL users, so that's British Sign Language. But remember, there is American Sign Language and Irish Sign Language and French sign language. And so it's not just a case of, oh, I can see that someone's moving their hands around. That must be accessible to our families. It's not. You need to check that it's British sign language and that the British sign language is at a standard, um, a qualified interpreter or a deaf actor. Now, with all of this dig digital work online, it's absolutely brilliant because it means that there's more opportunity to employ deaf actors in order to create that access through BSL. It doesn't just have to be booking an interpreter because the interpreters can work with a deaf actor, so they're providing the access. And that is going to be the, you know, that's going to heighten the quality of that connection between a deaf audience and your show. Um, audio description, but again, as we, we don't really focus on that, but I think it's really important that um, 
as a collective thinking about accessible theatre we we're aware and again with hashtags on social media knowing to put a capital letter at the beginning of each word so that when a sight reader is reading that hashtag for visually impaired people they know it's a new word if it's just one word and um, they can't read it so it's just thinking about other people who might have different needs um, another way could be to provide a script um, again that doesn't reflect all your blocking and all of your creating of your work if you give the actor the script actors uh, you know the audience members they're great they will imagine your play or your piece by reading the script which will be their show and so it's really important to think about what does your work justice also in terms of labeling and language it's really important to get that right so talking about deaf and hard of hearing people that's that's okay you know not uh hearing impaired or people that struggle to hear no it's deaf and deaf is a really strong identity and again especially with family theater we can you know we're empowering these young people by saying yes you're deaf and that's great these are deaf actors and these are deaf adults and we can all be in that together important for their whole identity growing up um yeah so again budget i know it's an absolute nightmare and we're all struggling for budgets and we've all been fighting for you know whatever tiny little seeds of funding has been made available but actually it shouldn't be an extra part of the budget in any project there should be access as part of it like it's not an add-on and actually charlotte gave me a message to to read out to everyone but it feels appropriate here and she said accessible theater is part of the creative process not an add-on not tokenism and it's certainly not a favor and i think it's just really important to think yeah we're not doing people a favor by adding captions or adding an interpreter it's not you know it's it's actually it doesn't benefit them any more than it benefits us as theatre makers you know we we want them to see our show we need to make a show which is actually watchable for people that might use need captions or uh, sign language and again i think the digital world it has its pros and cons and as long again it relies on that certain level of having the technology but geographically we can reach a much wider wider deaf audience and um, by putting that access there it doesn't matter if they're in exeter or edinburgh or you know anywhere across the country so we can raise our audiences so again if you're struggling to talk to somebody about budget and um, as we know those conversations can be quite difficult trying to explain your creative process and they're like but we're the budget holders actually you're going to raise that audience potential and again with the digital world there are all these amazing free things like youtube and facebook and instagram and apparently TikTok. i'm <laughs> i'm not that confident about that one but you know these things are free for us to engage with our audiences in a new way and actually they all have elements that we can use to make our work accessible obs is another one which is quite technical but there are lots and lots of youtube help videos not just for obs but for all of them about live streaming everything and i'd actually fully recommend getting sucked into a wormhole of youtube help videos because they're actually really good and i think because they're all getting paid for however many watches they get they make them quite clear and you can pause them and no one knows where you've gone back how many times um again i think it just takes more time especially as practitioners where we're used to going into a room seeing our young people responding and um, you know repitching a whole show if we can see that people in the room aren't right and it aren't the right kind of to what we've rehearsed we will change that and um, and again emails i think we're so lucky we can send an email so easily to another company and go yeah you know i think your captions look amazing i'm going to email you and say they look amazing how did you do them we can do that we don't have to wait for the postman to like deliver all these letters we can engage with each other and i think that's a really important part of building our industry again we need to engage with each other and acknowledge that there's so many amazing deaf uh theater makers who have been battling for years and years and years to get to the level we're at now and if we weren't we wouldn't be creating the work we're creating if they hadn't gone through so many barriers to get to here and so again, there's a few apps there which are, 
you know, I haven't used them all, but they've all they were all recommended on various Twitter feeds. Um, again, a bit of a Google search or even on Twitter, uh, searching for good captioning apps, and everyone seems to have done the exploration for us. So again, I think it's really good to acknowledge that and and use what we're all learning. So I thought it was worth just briefly if you because i imagine a lot of hearing theater makers might be adding captions to their work and that might be a bit daunting because you don't want to do it wrong it's a lot of time to invest if you're going to do it wrong so i thought i'd show a few examples of different types of captions and different uh levels of success um as me as a hearing person and i'm sure alex's experiences also have been affected by different layouts but I think it's really important we design our captions. Don't just think of it as a, oh, no, you know, I've got to quickly add on some captions for the deaf audience. Just going to add them on. Because actually, those captions will reflect your work. So thinking about the font, the size of the caption, is it going to affect how people see what's happening in the main image? Balancing that so you've got some text and then you see your image. Really thinking about audience focus, which again goes back to us as theatre makers the hours that we spend blocking a scene, we now need to block in our captions or block in where we want our interpreter. It should all be at the same level of focus and concentration. Um, and again, timing. Um, if the captions are going super fast, then I don't know how we expect someone to read that and then see what's happening and then go back. And it's, it's, it's not great. Um, and again, being consistent. I think this is a really important thing, which I'll come back to again in a moment, actually. Um, but in terms of some of these, some of these pictures might be clearer than others if you are watching a whole show. Um, in terms of thinking about where those captions are going to be placed, and I'm not saying you should all use the same font. I think there's a couple which are using different fonts, and that works really well for the content. And again, the captions should become a character in in our work. Um, again, so here, what should be accessible? I think if we're thinking about making theatre for like accessible for family audiences, we need to make all of our programme. So if we're a venue, it's you know it's great to have the one-off interpreted show, but why would anybody, why would any deaf people know about your venue if there's one show in the entire season that they can go to? Um, there's no investment, there's no engagement with the venue. I probably wouldn't even know it was there. So it should, we can, we can think wider, and especially as we're rebuilding, we can think about how workshops, performances, and Q&As are all accessible. Um, again, if there's any work experience opportunities, how are they accessible for deaf young people? Auditions, uh, show calls, uh, promos, like there are so many promo videos that are not accessible but then they'll be advertising for an interpreted show. And it's like, there's, there's a few little connections that I think we need to think about the wider area of access if we want to get the audiences. If we don't want deaf audiences, then we don't need to book an interpreted show. <laughs> and again, not expecting deaf audiences to find our work. I think if you're talking about hearing made theatre, I, I definitely talk to a lot of theatre makers who want to make their show accessible, and they're like, but we booked an interpreter. And myself, with my other hat as a theatre interpreter, I've interpreted a show. And afterwards, the performers have said, so do you think there was any deaf people there? And I kind of say to them, well, the promo video didn't have any captions, did it? And they say, oh, no, it didn't. And I'm like, well, where, where did you tell people? And it's not a case of just expecting deaf people to, to go through the brochure and go, oh, well, I might be able to see this show or I might be able to see this one. People don't have the time, like none of us have the time to go, oh, well, I might look at this brochure in case there's something there for me. We need to be proactive and saying, look, we're making these shows accessible. Come and see them. Are you interested in this show? And so that's where I think in terms of a wider ma marketing strategy of making accessible theatre is thinking about that outreach, maybe participation, maybe um, the deaf young people want to get involved you can offer them like a workshop a panto workshop before the show that so means they really understand what pantomime is about that they're allowed to shout out that they're not you know engaging in the whole experience rather than just expecting deaf people to fit into a hearing person's world because we've given them an interpreted show or we've given a captioned performance and again in terms of 
having a community ambassador or a deaf person in the community who can really say, yes, this venue really believes in access and they are making all of these accessible things. That's a really great way of championing your work. And again, working with deaf artists, inviting them to your workshops. And maybe, maybe it does take a bit more of an invite at the beginning because they don't know your venue's there. But or your, wherever your event is, but actually working with deaf artists, asking them to come into a rehearsal or, or talking to them about a show. And um, there's lots of ways of engaging with deaf artists and they will tell you about your show and whether actually they're interested or maybe they're not interested. And again, I think a lot, especially from like the Edinburgh Fringe Festival where we went uh, last year, we had so many people giving us flyers about accessible, sh about their show and we'd ask them, is there a caption show? Is there an interpreted show? And they'd say, no. And we're like, well, there's no point giving me your flyer. Don't waste your flyer. And it, they were like, oh, but we, we don't have the budget. We don't have the budget. But again, it's about building that relationship beforehand and building trust because we had other people that said, oh, yes, it's very visual. Our actors are amazing. You can definitely understand exactly what they're doing because their acting is so wonderful. I'm like, cool. So there were a few shows that we, we went to or we were told that it, they were going to be accessible and they weren't. Now, if you go to a venue and that happens once, would you go back again? Would you go back a second time to see it, even though it's a different production company? Would you go back? So actually, I think as venues, we can build that trust with the deaf community in a way that maybe touring companies don't get a chance to. But again, touring companies have got their own responsibility to build that network as well. Um, but yeah, so I've kind of sped through everything and I think I went just slightly over the, the 20 minutes. But um, again, we've been trying to share online work. We think it's so important that we all support each other in building these networks of trustworthy, accessible work. So we've been working with Hot Cold Theatre and Deaf and Hearing Ensemble to make an online resource So we started off on Twitter and then we've moved it to Facebook as a kind of easy platform so people can actually find a whole list of accessible shows without having to waste their time trawling through a million shows that aren't necessarily accessible. Um, I don't know if it's worth opening up to questions, I guess, but we're all, if people need time to think about questions, we are always open to an email or a message on any of the social medias that if it comes to you later on. Great, thank you very much, Laura. Um, yes, I think let's go into questions now. If anyone has any questions for either Laura or Alex, and depending on um, who responds in this section, I'm going to try and pin the person's video who's responding. So if you can't see either Laura or Alex, just let me know in the chat and I'll know that I'm doing something wrong and I will correct it. Um, so I'm going to just pause for a moment so people can have an opportunity to think about any questions or anything they'd like to ask, maybe thinking about what you're doing at the moment and if there's something you would like to ask related to that, um, and either Laura or Alex will respond. So I'm just going to pause now. Okay, I think I could hear someone typing, but I've not seen anything come through in the chat. So um, if anyone does want to pose a question, feel free to post it in there or just switch your microphone on. Um, uh, we've got one come through now. Um, from, this is from Alison. Um, so the question is, what do you think about the theatre we have every day that the sessions from London have not interrupted, but Scotland has. What do you think about the theatre we have every day that the sessions from London have not had interrupted, but Scotland has? Danny, it's just in terms of Becky checking. What was that middle word? Was it sessions? Sessions, <laughs> yes. 
Thank you. Alex, do you want to answer that in terms of receiving information and the fact that our our, our leaders are not necessarily providing information and interpreters? I'm going to, um, just Becky speaking, I'm just going to, Laura's just asking if you want to maybe respond to thinking about the example now. Yes, so I'll just go. <laughs> now, London MP about Corona put interpreter. Have interpreter. What do you think about that? Do you want to respond? Okay, so this is Becky speaking, but it's the words of Alex coming up to you. So if we think politically and in terms of the current situation in which we find ourselves, since things have begun, there has been no British Sign Language in presence for the Prime Minister and the parliamentary uh, responses. Wales and Scotland, however, have been able to provide this, but England thus far haven't provided a BSL interpreter. There's been a lady online um, a woman called Lynn, who's created a fantastic campaign about essentially saying, where is the interpreter for the political broadcast? Where is the interpreter? In reality, it's a massive risk for the deaf community to not have a deaf um, a BSL interpreter present for those announcements because of a lack of information. There's also been a hashtag established called Where is the Interpreter? There's been a campaign whereby images of deaf people have been put together to really show the oppression that is being generated by this lack of provision by the, the English side of things of the government. It's massively, massively aggravating that it, this is continuing to happen. And I, I think maybe to... Um... Just to add to that in terms of family at home and um, thinking about how if there's young children, hearing children with deaf parents, how does that affect, you know, it's stopping parents from looking after their children, which is just mind blowing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Alex is coming in on that if he may, if he may add a wee bit to that as well. To be honest, I think that is why it is paramount that theatres like Handprint, for example, are doing the work they do. Because as we've discussed today, there is so much digital content happening. And, you know, as a deaf actor, I've been sort of asked to put that out into the world as well. But if we think about people at home, how are they going to actually access that information from their homes? You know, it might have been okay before, they might have been able to go out and as we discussed, see an interpreted show, for example, but how are they going to access it at home? I've been working with a local charity, uh, Meet Where I Live, for the last few years on and off. And uh, they've recently received some funding, which is to do with um, providing access to cinema. And what we do is we receive a film. It's generally speaking, it's a Disney film, for example. And we receive the filmed content. And then I myself, as a deaf person, I practice alongside that film. The film would have um, subtitles provided, but and indeed it would also have audio description. And then what we do in the cinema is that we have a sort of friendly viewing atmosphere. So the lights are slightly dimmed, and if people want to leave the cinema, they can if they're sort of feeling it's a little bit overwhelming or anything. But it means that it's a Disney film with access and BFL and audio description that is there and is available for, for audiences to come and see. And I guess my concern, my worry, is how Corona and the COVID situation is going to really impact on the in mental health of those deaf young people. You know, they've really felt a part of a community. They've felt a part of a, a spirit and a, a locality, being able to go and see these films together. And yes, we've got the digital content, as we've discussed already, but I think we really need to bring it back to our thinking about theatre, as Laura's very, very openly said, about captioning, about, um, you know, this in a way is our first foray into the digital world, isn't it? It's about thinking creatively, about improvising, about working out 
how we can translate our theatre practice into the sort of digital world and the new normal that we find ourselves in. It's about sort of encouraging that generation of oppression rather than operation. <laughs> And I think what we as a deaf community need is we need to be heard. Yes, it's not just about sort of like disregarding people and leaving them at the sidelines. It's about us being heard. It's like we're the last rung on that ladder, but we're a community, we're a rich and vital community. And, you know, we discussed earlier about theatre programming. If we think about local theatres and they've got their lovely brochure with their dates in it, what have you, and there might be six times that there's a performance of um, a show and there might be an interpreter booked into one of those nights of that show. But as Laura said, how do we know about that as a deaf community? You know, if we transfer that information to the digital land that we find ourselves in, how are we going to know about that provision of accessible content? We need it, for example, to be popped onto the theatre Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. Get the word out there and let us know what you're doing. It's not kind of, it's not like you need to put the teeniest, weeniest little bit of budget into buying an interpreter in and then think, oh, if you've done that for this time around, come on, gang, it's the 21st century. There, is a, there are a lot of deaf and disabled people out there who you know, give, would give recommendation to theatre, I think Alex is trying to say they should they be able to access it. I went recently to, oh, well, yes, got it, to Dank, which is a Manchester Dank uh, sort of uh, collaboration, I think Alex is trying to say there, which is an industry event whereby they bring in speakers, casting directors from the telly and so on, and we were able to discuss the actuality of the situation that I think it's 80%, I might be wrong with that statistic, but 80% of deaf and disabled people in England are, are invisible to an extent. Like, where is the visibility of those people on our screens and our, on our stages? So, yes, lots to think about at the moment. And I think it's that feeling, isn't it, that we've got to keep fighting the fight. We need to keep that going. It's imperative, particularly given the circumstances we find ourselves in now. Thank you, Alex. That, I think, has given us all a huge amount to think about. Um, we have a couple of other questions. I'm just going to jump straight into those. Um, so Victoria has said, hi, Laura and Alex. Thanks so much for your presentations. I'm from the Museum of London, where we are looking to develop more live streaming events. These are usually partly a pre-recorded exhibition tour, and then we do a live Q&A with a curator. Visitors comment on Facebook and questions are read out live over video. Do you have any guidance on how we can ensure the streams are accessible? Laura, over <laughs> <laughs> uh, With... Uh, so where we've been playing with using Facebook Live and YouTube Live, um, we've had we've been doing it with Mousetrap Theatre Project. It's it's been our first exploration of it really, um, where we've had the two boxes. So we can do you can do it through Zoom, so you can have multiple people. Where we'd have at the moment we have one uh, deaf practitioner leading, and then I'm there interpreting it into BSL. So that could be a way um, of having that extra, so you're filming it through Zoom and then putting it onto Facebook Live. So you've got the two boxes for BSL or perhaps adding captions. Um, or again, if, if, you, if you're able to work with a deaf actor in, in the situation, so you have the curator and then you have the deaf actor and maybe an interpreter or a relaying it to the deaf actor. So then where you're streaming to Facebook Live, you'd have the curator and the deaf actor so that it would come through, but you'd have that, that bigger presence of the deaf actor being involved in the exhibition, perhaps. Um, again, I think it very much depends on the content, but they would be the first places that I'd, I'd have a play with. But feel free to, to send us an email. We can always ask some of the deaf actors to, to send you a message or to set up a conversation. Yeah, <laughs> love the power of Zoom going all over the place. <laughs> it is great. <laughs> Alex is just 
Cheryl on that as well. Just a suggestion for us here. There's a, um, oh, I recently signed a film called Moana. I did an interpretation of that a few weeks, weeks ago in the cinema, as I was talking about before. Two or three weeks ago, I think it was. And it was interesting, within the, uh, the TV guide on BBC One, I think it was on a Saturday, there was a, a Moana shown at six. And I thought, oh, this is brilliant. This gives me the perfect opportunity to do like a live run through or a live sort of version of this film. So what I did was I used um, some posters, some digital posters in this instance, and I got the word out there that I would be providing a translation. So I had my laptop in front of me, I had my telly screen on the other side, I could see the BBC One showing Moana live on the TV, and then the people at home could watch me through our internet connection providing a translation. And it's interesting that young deaf children, for example, could see that um, could see that translation. And then you know what? We had such a lovely sort of time together at the end of it, having a good old chat. And as Laura said to us before, they were really expressing views of that they were just missing being involved in their community and their sort of previous nor normal lifestyle. And, um, you know, it was interesting to be able to have that give and take with them at the end of the film there. One person was saying to me, um, they felt that since lockdown, they've kind of been, um, it was something that they could really kind of feel a part of and, and a bit something from the old time that they could be a part of again. Oh, D Danny, I don't think we can hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I've gotten so used to muting myself, I keep forgetting. Um, yes, sorry about that. So thank you, Alex. Um, that, um, that's really amazing to hear about. Um, we had one comment from Alison, who I think this is related to um, the answer that Alec, Alex gave previously um, about the difference between England and Scotland and Wales in terms of um, interpreters on their political commentaries. So Alison has said, um, without information about accessibility in the first time someone reads about an event, they will make the decision about whether it is open to them. They don't want to wait to have the terms and conditions or just the Q&A, um, which I thought was just a really useful thing to add in as well. I don't think we have any other questions in the chat, but if anyone hasn't had a chance to ask something that they would like to or something that they don't feel has come up yet, do feel free to take this opportunity now. Just pop your mic on if you would like to, or otherwise pop a question in the chat. And we can pose that to either Julia, Laura, or Alex for you. Uh, Danny, just, just to bring up, I think there was a comment somewhere in the chat that about the fact that we're all being encouraged to wear masks on public transport. Um, and more and more in the street, and obviously the impact of that on deaf people generally, but also deaf young people, seeing a lot of people walking around with masks, whereas, you know, they've, they've been gaining so many skills in lip reading. And I think it's just worth all of everyone kind of having that at the back of their head, that a lot of people, even if they're not wearing a mask because they're a lip reader, it's all of everybody else. <laughs> um, and I think the communications about that have been quite strange on who can wear a mask and who doesn't have to but again as I mean if you're walking around and that's a complete I mean it's a visual communication barrier that's being increased so just something for all of us to to keep in mind as opening up venues as well how we can kind of keep it's even more important for information and communication to be clear <laughs> yeah that's a great, that's a great point Laura um, and I think it was Alison again who mentioned in the chat, This, I think this is the comment you were talking about, that um, there's an organisation in Liverpool that are making masks with clear portals around the mouth um, and have a pattern that they can share with people so that people who need to lip read or see expressions can actually try to get through that barrier a little bit. But you're right, I think it's something really useful for any venues who are looking to open at some point to think about having that restriction for everyone and if they're saying everyone needs to be using a mask is that creating additional barriers for people 
um, and actually those masks are kind of an accessibility thought as well. Um, I have actually just spotted a question that I hadn't um, asked. This is from Sally Ann. Um, she said, would you recommend um, the captions that Facebook offers? So Alex is in on that. Alex is saying, well, I would say it's not really, there's not really enough filmed, uh, captioned film content on Facebook as it is. Um, so if there's going to be filmed content, do put the captions on there. But I think in terms of that particular question, I'm not sure I'm entirely clear, Sally Ann. So do you mean in the style of the fonts that's being used in the Facebook captions? Alex is just rereading the question. Oh, do you know, I didn't know that there was a facility for Facebook to have captions on there. I think, again, with that, uh, I think having, uh, if they're auto captions, it's worth checking <laughs> um, what it's automatically writing, whether that's Facebook, YouTube, or what have you. Um, and in terms of your content, actually, does it reflect the character or the brand that, of your company or venue? Like, does it reflect you um, within that? Great, thank you, Laura. Um, we have another question. This is from Amanda. Um, Amanda says, potentially a big question, sorry. Um, big questions are great, Amanda. Um, particularly a question for Laura and Alex. Have you seen the arts world shift to digital as a positive for building awareness of deaf theatre and or communications or a hindrance? What would you like to witness going forwards? Certainly, in the excessive number of Zoom calls I have been in, I would suggest that 60 to 70% of them had BSL interpreters, which is more than I have ever witnessed pre-COVID-19. Um, so the questions there are, would you see the shift to digital um, as a positive or a hindrance, and what would you like to witness going forward? Laura? <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely big question and I think it's a really exciting big question because you're right having so much time digitally has definitely changed a lot of our perspective on things and seeing shows. I think one thing which is amazing is that deaf people have been using video calls for so long that they have been so used to this kind of zoom fatigue that hearing people are suddenly going, oh, no, I can't just watch a video for two hours or three hours or what have you. And actually, deaf people have been experiencing that for a long time. And so that will definitely spread awareness in terms of the way hearing things are set up. Um, just understanding, just getting information through a two dimensional screen that way. I think in some ways it's really good because there has been a lot of interpreters being booked for big panel discussions, but I would wonder how many deaf artists are being invited to lead on those discussions and give their points of view in how venues are being redeveloped, or how many deaf-led theatre companies have been linked into those networks that may have been formed in places that have traditionally been hearing-led, and actually as we rebuild digitally, everyone's got that responsibility to make sure we're reaching out to all of those people that aren't in the original conversation. And in terms of theatre digitally and whether it's more accessible itself, I'm not sure that it is because I think theatre so much, I mean, I definitely personally have really struggled watching some shows online because it's so much about that in the present and of that moment and not missing anything. Um, of that moment. So as long as the access is in the venue, 
I think if it's got proper access in the actual place, it's great. Yes, it's fantastic to add those captions now, and I, I would definitely watch most YouTube streams of shows with the captions, partly because you can't see the people as clearly unless it's been filmed at a very, very high quality. So I'd say captions are even more important. But whether that, that impact of people going, oh, we need to make this successful, whether that impact follows through, at the moment, I'm not sure. And I think, again, it's about using this time to re-empower people and re-empower um, deaf people, not just as actors, but as people involved in the marketing teams and involved in the outreach teams and involved in different roles within producing theatre, as well as the audiences. I'm not sure if I answered your question then or just went on a bit of a, <laughs> a tangent. But um, yeah, I think we'll see as we rebuild and whether access will be part of these very limited budgets or whether access is going to be put off until people go, oh, we're going to set our venues up again and make sure we have our staff employed. Oh, and then we'll think about access. I don't know, which would be a scary, scary thought, I think. <laughs> Alex is now, I would say to myself, it's a strange old world at the minute, isn't it? It's right that, you know, there absolutely are positive things going on and coming out of this. But I, and some of our, our deaf actor community have been, for example, creating stories and things to put online via British Sign Language that people can see. So we're trying to really motivate people to do that. And it's interesting that maybe people would watch that and think, oh, I never thought of that before. Maybe there are ways to be creative and flexible and to improvise. So that was a positive thing to come out of working from home and to think digitally, that actually we're all having to think outside of the box and uh, with a view to putting everything we've got onto this sort of new digital platform that we find ourselves with. But I feel it's not enough. As Laura says, it's not like, oh, yeah, I brought in an, an interpreter from my webinar. That will do now. You have to place access at the centre of your practice. <laughs> Alex is now in the sunshine. <laughs> Great, thank you both for answering that question. Um, I'm just going to quickly scroll through to see if we've had any other questions. Um, Sally Ann made a comment that um, as someone who is hard of hearing, she finds it much better over video than she does in face-to-face -face meetings, but it all depends on the quality of the audio, which varies um, for each person who is talking. That's a great point, Sally Ann. Does anyone have any questions that they don't feel have been addressed? Um, Danny, it would be great to um, it would be great to know anybody who who's making work at the moment and what their biggest fears are about right, accessibility, whether it's about language or what are the biggest kind of worries about improving access. Yeah, great question, Laura. Um, could everyone just write a quick short phrase maybe just a few words about um, what their greatest fear is at the moment related to access and making work um, it might be just generally or it might be particularly related to the pandemic um, if everyone could just write just a short line about that in the chat that would be great so I'm just going to give everyone 30 seconds to do that
Okay, as everyone keeps adding, I'm just going to read some of these out, if that's okay. So if any of the speakers just want to jump in um, and interrupt me if there's anything they'd like to interject. Um, so we have connectivity for audiences. My worry is that all of the hard, all of our hard work we have done will have been for nothing. For me, it's about how you can curate content so people aren't overwhelmed and know where to find what they need, which I think links to what Julia said in her session, actually. Um, creating content that is actually useful and helpful. Getting activities to older people who are rurally and socially isolated and don't have computer or smartphone access. Um, touch and interactivity. Um, a generation of children feeling like they're being told no all the time making sure your content reaches people, rebuilding the trust of our audiences so that they're entering a safe space when attending live performances in the future. Yep. Um, getting it right, that's a good one. Um, the culture team has in the past concentrated on mass events, and I as part of the team have been more involved with community and smaller scale events, which I think is equally as important. And strengthening our creative communities. As a craftsperson, I've already lost one outlet. Um, and thinking about when we start to return, how do we continue to run BSL tours, AD tours, et cetera, when crowds are discouraged? How do we continue these programs with social distancing and no touch? Um, and place, ensuring that you are responding to the community around you. Digital has suddenly sent our content global, but local is so important. Thank you everyone for those answers. Um, and hopefully you'll have seen something in other people's answers that maybe reflects that there are people having similar concerns as you at the moment. Um, Laura, you posed that question. So is there anything that you would like to reflect on there? I think, um, I mean, all of them are definitely, I fears that I think myself and other colleagues have, have definitely discussed in, in various meetings on various different projects. It, it is completely all of these fears and one day one and then the other day it might be, you know, it shifts again. And I think that idea of connectivity um, we can actually build by talking to our audiences. And I think it's quite easy as theatre makers, we, we get so focused on the planning or the strategy or the, or like someone said about the kind of connecting the other side of the world because we can, but actually when we start to, who are we actually making it for our local community and actually asking them what makes it easier or asking them what kind of things they want is, is just so important and often we forget <laughs> um, and yeah that connectivity I think it's something we're all craving and something that digitally we feel like we've half got it <laughs> but actually we all know that it's just a two-dimensional screen and I mean BSL a three-dimensional language on a two-dimensional screen it's, it's immediately it, everything shifted and then just on terms of the BSL tours and things I think what's really really cool about um, AD tours and BSL tours, sign language, we don't have to be right close. Like sign language, I've seen people signing, you know, we've had sign conversations through Windows before. So actually in terms of that kind of communication, sign language has got a lot of bonuses for being able to create um, perfect screens and go through separate areas and things. And the same with AD, if people, if you can download an audio description tour onto your own mobile phone, and that's connected to your headphones. Actually, in terms of the access, it, it supports the social distancing. There's, um, I, sorry. Is that all right? Um, the first one is around um, shows for children who aren't confident readers. I think that that is a really big issue but i'm wondering whether there might be some helpful things there looking at pecs or looking at widgets and integrating symbols in lieu of words if you look at the pecs and the widget symbols a lot of them are quite intuitive and children from a very young age are used to seeing them because they see them used on something special with mr tombol quite often so with our shows we sign all our shows in macaton and early signs sometimes we use signs from different systems because they look more dramatic and we want to go to something dramatic and much more expressive. And um, what we do is we keyword sign. So Makaton, you can sign every word in the sentence, and Makaton is designed to go with speech rather than instead of speech. And um, so what we do is we pick out the key ingredients 
in each sentence, in each bit, we want to convey the bit where the emotion and the emphasis is, and that's the bit that we focus on signing for children. And you can do the same with symbols. So it would be about looking how you can integrate those and working out what are the key bits that you need to pick out and express in images as well as words. And that can sometimes compensate. I think the other really important point is the one about children being told no and not touching things. I think we're kind of risking bringing up children who are quite anxious about touching things. They're getting quite strong messages about don't touch, this is dangerous. And I think that is a problem. And I'm wondering if there's something around um, sort of make like touches. So rather than if you, for example, if you're at a, a, a museum exhibit, like, like with my pump on the green, you can't crank the handle of the pump. We can't have hundreds of people cranking the handle of the pump, but we can make like by acting it out, by finding something else that they could do, by using disposable or junk things that can be thrown away or reused and sterilized rather than the actual thing. And it's it's not as good as the real thing, but it is kind of a halfway house until we are at that stage where we are all confident that our sort of disease control is, is under under management, if that point ever comes. Alex is just going to come in on that, if I may. So uh, where Julia was just checking then, it's just uh, something's occurred to me from that. Back in 2018, I was part of a show uh, with Ramps on the Moon. Um, and that's a consortium of a variety of theatres, um, and including Grey Eye Theatre as well. And every show, uh, show that is provided by or created by that has integrated BSL, um, captions, audio description, and these are integrated into the fabric of the show and indeed of the set at some time. So it was interesting that with the audio description, for example, we would have a touch for our blind and visually impaired audiences with beforehand, which was fantastic. So I wonder about the ramifications of that now in our given situation. <laughs> you know, it would be so lovely to see theatres take that on as a sort of a model of good practice to have that sort of touch tool as part of their work. Thank you for that, Alex. That's a, that's a really interesting point. And um, there's an interesting question there as well about how is there is there a place for that in probably not at the moment with the with the current pandemic and restrictions but what that will look like going forwards when if people are still feeling nervous about touching things that other people are touching and 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 how that can um have a place in in the future um i think that that might be all of the questions we have. So if it's okay with everyone, um, I'm going to wrap things up. So first of all, I would just like to say a huge thank you to Julia, to Laura and Alex um, for delivering a great session for us all today. Thank you to everyone who has participated and asked questions and listened um, and been really curious and engaged. Um, we're really grateful that you joined us here today as well. Um, Thank you to Anna from the Family Arts Campaign. I'll hand over to you in a moment if um, you'd like to say anything to close the session off. I'm just going to quickly post a link to a survey in the chat box. Um, it's just a really short evaluation form that we'd be really grateful if you could fill out. It will really help the AMA and the Family Arts Campaign um, just learn about what you find useful in the session um, and to take that learning going forwards as well so we can keep on delivering good content for you. So um, please do fill that out. As I mentioned at the start, we will be sharing the recording of this session afterwards. Um, so probably tomorrow I will send you a link so that you can revisit it. You'll be able to see the slides, see the videos of the trainers and look at the chat as well. And we will put all of the links that were shared in the chat in that email as well so that you can revisit all of those resources. Um, so I think that's enough from me. So I just want to say thank you again to everyone. And I will just quickly hand over to Anna from Family Arts Campaign, just in case there's any um, last things you would like to add, Anna. Thanks, Danny. I think you, you've summed up everything so well. Um, I just wanted to echo really that a massive thank you to Julia, Laura and Alex for your amazing insights and such valuable and, and really moving actually insights um, into 
into what we've discussed today um, and also a big thanks to Becky for providing BSL today and for Danny and the team at the AMA for hosting us so well and um, making sure everything goes smoothly which is a great help especially when you're running something um, digitally. Um, yeah, as Danny said, we'll, in, in the survey, there's, there's a, a section there where you can tell us what you'd like to see from future webinars. So this is something that the campaign team and the AMA are going to be looking at more in future. So please do add what you would like to see next there, really, because we want to make sure what we provide is, is obviously relevant um, to, to what, what you need. Um, and, and yeah, in, in the survey as well, there's also an option to sign up to the, the family arts or the age friendly standards if you'd like to, to find out more about those. And we'll, we'll send, as Danny says, a follow up with all the information from today and more details about how you can get in touch with the campaign and just stay, stay up to date, really. Um, but yeah, a huge thank you to everyone. I've really, really enjoyed it and hope you have too. And we'll hopefully see you all again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your days. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.